Um, so the patient history, uh, it was a 40 year old right handed female with a past medical history of Hashimoto's thyroid disease and pretty significant migraine who presented um, for evaluation of just left ear flushing and burning that started about a year ago. Um, symptoms kind of appeared out of nowhere acutely one morning when she noticed uh, in the mirror that her left ear was red um, and then subsequently warm to the touch. Over the next few months, um, the ear pain pro progressively got worse um, and turning into a, like a burning sensation that she described like it was on fire. And the only uh, relief she was receiving at that time was uh, an ice pack that she was using at home. During these episodes, um, it kind of presented like a migraine. Oftentimes she would get a migraine with it um, with uh, left-sided head pressure, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. Um, and these could occur, you know, one to 10 times throughout the day, or they could remain in a static state throughout the day. Um, by the time she saw Dr. Morganlander and myself, uh, she had seen an endocrinologist and her women's health doctor, but without resolution of symptoms because they did, they did some labs where they didn't really do a whole lot of management. Um, they tried 20 milligrams of propranolol that had been started, but it didn't really lessen the severity very much. Um, and so by this point, I, you know, Dr. Morganlander knows all this stuff, but I needed to look at my uh, nerves uh, of the ear. So there's the picture of the patient right here. Um, you can see how bright and red it is compared to her face and her neck down here. Um, and the main nerves we're looking at here are the greater auricular and the lesser occipital. Um, depending on what nerve innervation of the ear picture you find, they're all gonna be a little bit different, um, but this is pretty consistent. So those are the two nerves that we'll talk about again in a little bit. And then as well as nerves, I wanted to look at the vasculature of the ear. So this um, superficial temporal artery that comes off the external carotid comes up and then gives off this posterior auricular branch, which is the one we are kind of concerned with that goes back here behind the ear. And so intervention, um, other than the blatant flushing and warmth to the touch of her left ear, her neurological exam was uh, normal, including autonomic function. So at the time we opted to increase the dose of the beta blocker from 20 to 40, try a short burst of prednisone, um, and we also sent off a Mayo dysautonomia panel, which uh, came back negative. She continued to follow up with us, uh, reporting minor improvement, but still no resolution, pretty, uh, and so she was still having some significant distress with this pain. So we started gabapentin, um, which was later increased through my chart um, up to 800 milligrams TID. Later on down the line through another visit, well, we tried Cymbalta 20, daily, um, again, without major relief. Uh, so at this point, we decided maybe let's try to send her to the Duke Pain Clinic for um, uh, a block of those two nerves that I talked about, the greater auricular and lesser occipital. And those did for maybe a few days help her, but they were not long lasting and she was right back to where she was. Um, significant improvement finally did come uh, when we tried Amavig which we all know is a headache medication. It's one of the new ones, a CGRP receptor antagonist. Um, and a CGRP does have a role in vasodilation and migraine. So what is this? Uh, I, I venture that no, not many of you have heard of this um, unless I've talked to you about it. Um, so there's another picture of someone with red ear syndrome. Um, so it's a rare syndrome. There's only about a hundred literature case reports. Um, and if you want to find papers actually written about it. I wanted to know the pool is running twenty four seven. Beth, can you mute, mute please? Thank if you. you. If you want to find uh, case reports about it, there's three to five maybe that you can find. Um, so it's a rare syndrome of severe burning and flushing of the external ear, just like you can see there. It's very warm to the touch. The patients often describe like their ears on fire. Um, it can radiate down into the jaw um, and even into the neck down that the pattern of that greater auricular nerve. It's typically asymmetric. And though we don't have many case reports, it does appear to affect females slightly more than males. Attacks uh, range in severity. They can last minutes, they can last hours, they can happen once a day, they can happen 20 times a day. Um, and again, we, we all get this from these about 100 case reports. It's not yet fully, um, excuse me, let me move my toolbar here. It's not yet included in the revised ICHD3 um, criteria, um, although it does often 
go hand in hand with patients with headache. So what do we think is going on here? We don't really know. Unknown pathophysiology, it's a theorized dysautonomia. Um, there is a good paper um, that talks about the vasculature, the parasympathetic uh, vasculature, and the potentially poor ability of the sympathetic perivasculature nerves to keep the microvessels constricted, allowing the parasympathetic division um, to go unopposed and to give this massive dilation of that area specifically, which was, would explain the flushing, the swelling, and the subsequent nerve irritation. Another proposed mechanism of dysfunction is uh, C2, C3 spinal nerve dysfunction, which give off those two branches I talked about earlier, uh, specifically the greater auricular nerve. Um, and then another possibility is that it's potentially a type of trigeminal autonomic cephalgia not yet fully understood. Um, so if any of you do see this, um, I would urge, you know, we, we see Amovig works, um, gabapentin might work in some patients, but uh, give it your best shot if you see it. Um, and I, there's my references, and I'd just like to say thanks to Dr. Morganlander and Dr. Collins for helping me through this case. Thank you very much, Jacob. So, um, Jacob, can you 